<laughs> but here's a lady who is going to do something uplifting. This is Ghazala Sharif, who has been my friend for a long, long, long time. She's, she's an emergency physician, and uh, she was at uh, Scripps, and, and basically she was just so talented. She gradually worked up, went up the ladder, and tell me what your job title is now. So Catch this. Corporate Vice President, Chief Experience Officer. Everybody's leaving. That's kind Chief, of a bad sign. Chief <laughs> Experience Officer. <laughs> I had to answer, what the heck's that chief experience off? Tell, tell us what a chief experience is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, so I'm an emergency physician, double board in pediatric emergency medicine, and so it's actually fascinating to me that I'm a chief experience officer, which means that I'm in charge of the system improving patient experience scores, and that's starting with the front lines, volunteers, physicians, just all the way through to, to the billing service. So my job is actually expanding as I go, and I'll, I'll tell you that I actually hated patient experience when it first came out about 10 years ago. I was quite offended. Oh, the good, wait for my slides. Yeah, I was actually quite offended that uh, we, because we had an administrator come and speak with our physician group to try and tell us how to be at the bedside. And some of the things that he wanted us to say were so scripted. I'm sure you've heard these before, but going up to our patients and asking them, are we exceeding your expectations today? And that just sounds really dumb, right? We're not going to say that. And in fact, one of our administrators wants us to delight our patients. Well, I'm not here to delight anybody. I don't know about you guys, but that's not actually you know what my role is. And so I was really put off by this whole idea of patient experience. Uh, but then I ran the ER at Rady Children's Hospital and had four urgent care centers that reported to me. And I'll tell you that every day I saw interactions that, that could have and should have been done differently. So it, it is fascinating to me that I'm in this role now just because I hated it so much, but I'm a firm believer that little things make a big difference. This is not rocket science. I was hoping that HCAPs and all this stuff would go away. It, it isn't. It's actually getting stronger now, right, because the government is involved with the value-based purchasing program and things like that. We'll talk more about it. So you kind of don't have a choice. You have to either come on board or or your scores are going to be reflective of that. And pretty soon ED um, caps is coming. Every year they postpone it. It was supposed to be out last summer, and now they say maybe next summer, but it is coming, and pretty soon that will be publicly reported as well, right? And you know what that means. Once it's publicly reported, there will be a financial ding associated with it going forward, just like there is for H caps. So some of this is just to teach you what not to do, just learn from my mistakes. Um, I do have a question to ask you, though, as I get started. I got an eval last week from somebody at Scripps. It was her first day at work. I told a real life story, and she was offended by one of the words that I used in the story. So I want to make sure you're not your ER. You probably you've heard this word before, but is it okay with you if I tell you the real story, or do you want me to be, you know, proper? You want the real story, right? And so I was actually quite offended that she was offended. I'm like, really? You've heard worse than that word before. Um, but there's always one. So if I'm going to offend you now, you might as well leave because <laughs> I get the rest of you want to hear the story. So I'll tell you that as I go forward. But it, it's fascinating to me, again, uh, that, that, that I'm in this role, but I want you to learn again from, from my mistakes. You all know why patients come to the emergency department. They come because they have no place else to go right? They're in pain. There isn't any other medical care available. Sometimes they do need a prescription, but a lot of times they come there for reassurance, right? And so I, I think of that as I go forward. And a big part of what we have to do is, is make people loyal, right? Because if they come to your ER and you don't get a good experience, they'll go to another ER. It's just the way it goes, and right? And I get it. There are times when I don't want patients to come back to my ER, right? And uh, I remember one night working a string of nights at one of our hospitals, five nights in a row, and every night they brought the same drunk guy back to the emergency department, every night. And it didn't matter which side of the ER I was working on, there he was. It was almost like they had a GPS for me, and they would put him on that side, right? And every night he asked me to marry him, every night. By the third night, I got a little annoyed with him, and I put my you know, hands on my hips, and I said, I said no yesterday. And I thought, well, actually, it was an aha moment for me because I realized that that actually was a shame on me, right? He could have asked me for a divorce that third night, but instead he asked me to marry him again, right? So it was a mindset change for me. And so I had to start thinking about that as I, as I went forward through my career as well, is not, not taking my feelings about somebody and, 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 and reflecting that on everybody else as well. So think about that when they do come to the ER. We have a physician on staff who I can tell exactly when he's been grumpy with his patients because when it gets busy, he starts asking them what their emergency is. Right. What's your emergency today? Well, a lot of times they don't have an emergency, right? But they, they come in because they don't have any place else to go, and I'll tell you that story later as we go on. But there's all kinds of issues in the emergency department. As you know, language barriers are huge. I, I trained in that era where we actually had a translator. Some of you remember that one. We had a real-life person in the emergency department. That was pretty cool, right? But then we switched to the phones, and I think the phones are so bad. We're trying to do some you know, telemedicine and things like that with our translators, but the phones are just, just, just really not great for patient care. I just feel that when I'll put it out there. So I decided I wasn't going to use the phone. I was going to use my own Spanish and, and get this family going a little bit faster. I went in and uh, very confidently told this patient that he had fractured his huevos. 
There was this look of sheer horror on their face because they came in with leg pain. I'm telling them something else, and I'm like, I said something really bad. Let me, let me, come, let me be right back. I go to the nurse's station, and they started laughing. They said, do you know what you just said? I didn't realize that Waves is also part of a male, male anatomy, so no wonder they were shocked. I was trying to say huesos, right? So then I stopped doing my Spanish uh, from that, that moment forward. Like I said, learn from my mistakes. Don't do that, right? Lots of inter interruptions, right? When we're looking at EKG, I can't even tell you. You guys know how many times I'm interrupted, right? Just looking at EKG, and we've had misses that way as well. Um, some ERs are putting out sort of a no disturb zone, right, for their doctors. Like, I'm in this little, little space. Don't bother me. Let me finish what I'm doing just to avoid the, the inter interruptions that we get. But more importantly, it's a, it, the communication that we do, right, the nonverbal. I learned a new, you told me to be myself, so I'm going to be. Uh, I learned a new phrase just recently, RBF. Who knows what an RBF is? Okay, you can say it. What is it? Resting bitch face, right? What a cool term. I actually didn't know that. Um, I'm giving a talk to a like, huge audience like this, and there's a guy kind of sitting right where you are. Can you raise your hand? You yeah, both of you. Raise your hand. Really. So you see him? So he's sitting right in the middle. So, you know, ER docs, we kind of scope, you know, just make sure you're all you know, okay. And I get to him, and he's like this. And I, I get up, there he is again. And I, you know, I can't concentrate because we all have a little bit of ADHD, right? Finally, I stop the talk and I go, you know, it doesn't seem like we're re I'm resonating. You do not like what I'm talking about. He goes, no, no, I'm concentrating. I'm like, well, stop doing that because you're, you're bothering me. Um, so I get, to the end of the, I get to the end of the talk. One of the things I'll tell you about later is a campaign I started called One Thing Different. Imagine if you all did one thing differently, what that could look like. And I'll tell you that later. But um, So I get to the end of the talk and I said, who wants to share their one thing different? And he's right there. And I can't even ignore him because he's right there. If he was here, I could pretend I didn't see him, but he's right in the middle of the go, me, me, me. And so I pick on him, and he goes, uh, I want you to know my name is Happy Jack. I'm like, well, you could have fooled me, right, because you're frowning at me the whole time. And he said, my one thing different is to change my RBF. And I thought, that's a really cool, but I went blank because I had no idea what that was, and 100 people yell out what it means. And I thought, God, I probably have one of those sometimes, right, especially in the emergency department when I'm concentrating. And I thought about it, and the most critical time for us is when we're taking away somebody's airway, right? And so I realized that I'm concentrating, I'm probably frowning, I'm checking the equipment, right, making sure the tube is ready, my laryngoscope is ready, and there's this uncomfortable silence in the room because the nurse is doing her part of it, I'm doing mine, and I'm sure we look like we're kind of grumpy. And so now all I do is I call it carrying out loud, I tell the patient what I'm doing. I'm going to be quiet for a couple of minutes, I need to focus, I want to make sure everything's safe for you, but I'm right here, if you need anything, just call my name. What a difference that made in the, in the atmosphere in that room that I didn't even notice. So I'm learning from staff as they go forward as well. Facial expression, so we talked about the RBF, so just watch, watch how we look. Staff uh, notices as well. This is a slide that Diana, Diane Birnbaumer gave me, and I thought it was interesting because you ask people, which doctor would you prefer? And so you guys, what's your answer? Which one do you prefer? The one on the right. But I will tell you, if I'm sick, I don't want some smiley guy. You know, seriously, I want someone who's serious, right? I do some uh, filming at work, and they try to, uh, try to coach me on how to be on stage, right? And so they're like, you need to smile more. And I'm in the middle of saying, patients come to us in their most vulnerable moment, and they say, smile. I mean, that's really dumb. How would I, why would I smile at that, at that moment, right? They come to us in the most vulnerable moments. It just, it's beyond me. So it depends, right? Sometimes if you're really sick, I want someone who's, who's focusing. So I think the answer is situational. Yes, you, wanna, you want a bouncy person in there, but I think it depends. All right, I'm going to talk more about this later, but sitting as, as part of that nonverbal communication is really important. Patients give you 15% extra time if you sit with them. They underestimate when you stand over them, and we'll talk more about that in the patient experience talk. I found that I, I do a lot of this myself, and I do that, this crossed arm thing, when I'm, when I'm concentrating right? It's not that I'm, you know, all these things, I'm not trying to be bored or convey that I'm not interested. So I think it's interesting that that's what the perception is, but I do it more, again, when I'm listening very intently to what the patient is saying or somebody else is saying. So I have to purposely uncross my hands and stand like this or, you know, stand like this, but uh, there is something to be said for that closed posture, but I do it because I'm, I'm listening. And then there's a study looking at eye contact. It's interesting, though, that the, the shorter the visit, the more the patients want that eye contact. It actually makes sense, right? If you're on the computer typing, and we're all doing that now with electronic health records, the shorter the visit, the more you need to make that eye contact, and that, that social touch is actually really important. I do a lot of physician shadowing. One of the ER docs I shadowed with, his very first patient, he goes in, and, and he's like, hi, I'm Dr. Smith. I'm here to take care of you. And he started right into the, right in the interaction. No handshake, no nothing. So I said, hey, you didn't, even, you didn't even shake that patient's hand. He goes, I don't like touching people. I'm like, you're an ER doc, for goodness sakes. Can't you at least put your hand on the shoulder and say, hi, I'm Dr. Smith. I'm going to take really good care of you. That is all that he did differently 
from what he was currently doing, and his scores have skyrocketed. People do appreciate that social touch. So if you don't want to shake hands, that's okay. I've had my own story of that. I was at Jacksonville, Florida, uh, when we got transferred. My husband's uh, in the Navy. And HCAPS and Press Ganey had just come out, and so I was trying to do the, the proper thing. And the resident came out to get me and said, can you look at this rash on this patient? And I said, sure, I'll come right in. Dad was wearing a suit and tie. I shook his hand. Hi, I'm Dr. Sharif. And then I looked at the kid's rash, and I said, hey, does anybody else in your family have this rash? And the dad goes, I do, right here. <laughs> Scabies, right? So I couldn't wait to get the heck out of there. I felt itchy all day. I put rid all over myself when I got home. I rid my kids, even though they weren't in the emergency department, just that psychosomatic reaction, right? Um, so I get why you might not want to shake somebody's hand, but clearly just a touch on the shoulder goes a long, long way as well. All right, so we talked about that. All right. We are under, under duress a lot in the emergency department, right? We have some very difficult patients to deal with. I learned my lesson. I actually pretend that I'm on video every single patient every single time, right? I do. I just do it. Because actually, when I first started thinking about this, I'll tell you that story that I asked permission for in just, just a sec here. Um, it's not far from the truth now, because the police officers have, wear a body cam, right? There's case reports of a surgeon and an anesthesiologist talking smack about the patient. She left her iPhone on. Uh, th that's happening more and more and more. So if you wouldn't want your interaction on YouTube the next day or that same day, then think about how you're responding. So my story was I was wor working at one of our local emergency departments. I'd just taken over the emergency department at Rady Children's Hospital, and I felt a change in myself. I was pulling up to Children's. I was really happy, and then I'd go to work. And I'm like, I, wasn't as, I wasn't quite happy to be there, right? And that's okay. But I wasn't, didn't think I was relaying that to anybody else. But I pulled into shift, and I, I start walking in, and I hear somebody yelling, just the top of her voice, yelling, yelling, yelling. So what do you do when somebody's yelling? What's your normal reaction? You're walking, you're here yelling. You can't help but look, right? Somebody else the other day said, I would run away as fast as I can. <laughs> okay, well, that's not the answer. Uh, so I'm just going to kick. So print it to you. I look over. She's yelling, yelling. I look over, and she catches my eye, and she goes, what are you looking at, bitch? You guys aren't shocked by that because <laughs> you're emergency physicians. So what's the right answer? You're laughing. What, what, what should I respond to that? All kinds of bad words coming to mind. <laughs> Seriously, though, I mean, this is what we're faced with, and this is, this is a difficult patient. It's not even my patient yet, but how do you respond to someone that's, that's already upset with you? That's great, right? Is there anything I can help you with? Somebody the other day said, I would say, I'm sorry you're having a bad day. I'm like, God, where did you come from? <laughs> you know, I'm sorry you're having a bad day. How can I help you? Or, you know, I heard you yelling. I wanted to make sure you're okay. How can I? You know, that's the right answer. She just bothered me that day, right? And we're all going to have those patients that trigger us. That hair in the back of my neck went up. She said, what are you looking at, bitch? And I looked at her and said, not much. And I kept walking. <laughs> I know, I'm the chief experience officer, right? Like, how the hell did she get her job? Uh, <laughs> So I, uh, so I, the doctor's checkout area was like, like right here, and so I thought, I'm going to get busted, right? Because here I am just insulting a patient, and, that's, and I, I knew it right away. Instead, I get a high five from the doc and the social workers. I guess you've been a pain in the ass all day. They just thought it was funny. Anyway, my punishment was what? That's my patient. So I get ready because now, <laughs> now I get a chance to apologize. I mean, you know, I'm really sorry that we started on the wrong foot. I'd really like to help you, blah, blah, blah. That's what I'm supposed to do. But I barely get in the door, and she starts up again. You're the bitch that told me not much to look at. So now another chance to apologize, right? But I didn't. She bugged me again, and I, de <laughs> I decided to own it. I said, yep, but I'm the bitch that's here to take care of you. So how's this going to go? It's taken me like 12 years to tell this story, just so you know, right? Because not, it's not my proudest moment. I hate to tell you this, but it actually turned out she started laughing because I like you, and that was the end of that. But that's not the answer. The answer is <laughs> do not insult your patients, right? Um, but then for that, that's how I got the idea of being on videotape, because that would not be one that I would want blasted all over the place, right? Because it's not my finest moment. But that, that, that being said, I you know, sensed a change in myself. I asked to get off the schedule. It took me three months to get off the schedule uh, because I realized I wasn't true to myself, right? That's not me. It's not me to insult patients. So I think we all have to sense when do you get to that point where you're no longer you know, functional or you don't want to be in that environment anymore. I just came from one of our disproportionate share hospitals. There's a young doctor there who's very jaded. He goes, well, I'm used to people calling me names all the time, and you know, my press gainy scores are going to be horrible because of that. And he, he needs to find a different place, right? Sometimes the best thing we can do is encourage people to find their next passion.
right? So keep that in mind as well. But take a moment for yourself before you go in there when you have those patients that do just drive you batty. And you know it, you know what it is. You'll tense up, you'll have that feeling in the gut of your stomach, and take a moment to, to move out. So here's my case. I just actually uh, switched into this shift because a friend of mine wanted to go on a date uh, with her boyfriend, and so I was, you know, decided to, to be a good, good colleague, and I took her shift. Just remember that no good deed goes unpunished, right? So this is one of my first patients. Parents of a 15-year-old male present to the ED requesting a drug screen. He's got normal vital signs, uh, no complaints, and he said, I'm not going to do that test. The father's a lawyer, and he threatens to sue you if you, uh, if you don't do that, if his son has any other problems. And in addition, he wants his 14-year-old uh, daughter to have a pelvic exam uh, to see if she's sexually active. And he just doesn't request the test. He goes, I'm going to sue your ass if you don't do them. So here's a difficult situation. How do we handle this? What's that? Call the police? <laughs> oh, call risk management? OK, but how do, you, how do you get out of that? I felt like Tom to sit his ass back down, by the way. But you know, that's not something that you say. Somebody's swearing at you. You don't say, you know, you don't say that to him. I will tell you that that he got on my he got on my nerves. I just barely got in again in the room, and he's he's demanding, he's pushy, he's saying he's a lawyer, and so I actually had to remove myself from that room for a minute because I knew that I didn't want to say anything that I would regret later. Because I've seen partners of uh, mine, the colleagues, answer back. You know, I don't have to do any of those tests, and they whip out the, the policies that say, you know, AAP and ASAP says, I don't have to do this for you, blah, blah, blah. It, it's not a good encounter. I knew that I, this was going to go badly. And so I, I said, you know, it seems like you little, need a little more time uh, with me. Let me go finish what I was working on. I'll be right back. So sometimes the best part is to get out of the room, right? And I got out of there, and I took a moment to, to calm myself, right? Um, and I, took that Zen moment, and this is how it felt. When I get out of this, someone's going to die. I was really mad. You know, I'm like, my friend you know, asked me to switch into this shift, and I'm going to call her up. I'm going to tell her she needs to get right back to the ER because I'm done. You know, I don't want to do this shift anymore. Uh, but then I realized this, this quote, you've achieved success in your field when you don't know whether what you do is work or play. And we love what we do, right? And I wasn't going to let this guy you know, interfere with that just because he was having a bad day. And I realized there was something more going on. So I, I, I went, composed myself. I asked the dad to step out for a minute. We took him in the little conference room that we had, and I said, there's something more going on here. You know, I'd really like to help you. Tell me what's up. And he just started crying. This big, bad bully started crying. He goes, you know, we're getting a divorce, and uh, I feel like I have absolutely no control at home anymore. So I really felt like this was a way for me to kind of get that, you know, I'm in charge kind of thing. And so, well, this is absolutely not going to be the way to do that. You're telling your kids that you don't trust them. I'm pretty sure that that's not what you want to do. How about this? And one of you mentioned risk management. We actually got the social worker involved instead, which was a better solution, right, because that's what they needed. They needed more uh, family counseling. So I said, let's do this. You and I are going to go back in there as one team, and you're going to say that you decided that you didn't want to have these tests done, right, because we don't have to do them. You know that, and I know that. But let's just give it to you, and, and you say that, that you decided that you don't want to have these done, okay? Give him the win. We went back in together. It was a whole different scenario than it could have been had I got riled up. Right. So the key here is not to get defensive. And I realized with that patient that I told you about, I got defensive. And uh, other groups have said, well, that's, you know, that's great that you got her on board. I said, that would have been the case had I done it on purpose. Right? If I said, well, I'm going to call her this name back because that's my strategy, that would have been different. But I did it out of anger. Right? And so you re realize that their bad day is, is worse than the day you're having. Right? And so Try and, try and make it work for everybody. That, that's just what worked for me in the past as well. So here's some things not to say. I, I really hate this. We're, we're doing our best right now. We're really busy. We're short-staffed. That doesn't help. And we hear, I hear it all the time, not only in the emergency department, but on the floors upstairs as well. I apologize to every single patient that I see, even if they've only been waiting for a few minutes, because they have. And I just say, I'm really sorry for making you wait. I really appreciate your patience. Right? The lorries are telling us not to say so sorry anymore, which I think is a shame. But you can at least say thank you for your patience. Right? I apologize for making you wait. I tell them I'm here now. I promise you my full attention. It's really hard to stay mad at me when, when I do that. If I'm expecting a phone call, like we always are, I do tell them, I just want to let you know that I'm expecting a phone call, but I will be right back. You can't say you f promise them your full attention and then you leave and come back. You know, that doesn't go well. But that's something I want you to say. What's your emergency today? I hear all the time. And in fact, I was coaching another doctor, and he couldn't figure out why his scores were low. So I rounded with him, and one of his patients was a two-year-old who'd been uh, brought in by the mom. She, uh, the kid had just a little bit of a runny nose, no fever, no real cough. And so uh, my friend goes in there, Simon, and he goes, what's your emergency today? 
And you could tell the mom was a little put out by that. She says, well, you know, he's here because, you know, I need to get a work, I need to get a school slip for him because the daycare won't take him back until I get a, a slip, right? And I can't get into my regular doctor. So he goes out to get the paperwork after examining him. And I always, when I round with somebody, I actually go back and talk to the patients to see how they felt. So I asked the mom, you know, how, how did things go today? And she said, I'm really upset. And I said, well, what made you so upset? She goes, you know, I came here because I had no choice. I could not get in my doctor's office. You know, I get paid by the hour and I can't take my kid back to daycare because I need the slip. I had no choice but to come to the emergency department. I don't want to be here anyway, right? And so I went out. I said, you know, thank you for the feedback. I went back and, and told Simon. He was mortified. He actually wasn't trying to be a jerk. He was trying to figure out what they were doing there, and that's his question was, your emer what's your emergency so he'd get to it? But instead of that, what he could have said is what brings you to the emergency department today. Simple change in language versus implying that we don't want you here, right? So, and then we usually get, we get defensive, right? And so this on the other side is a better way to say things, which I'll put up here now. But, so one of our docs is actually one of our surgeons that I, that I work as well. I work across the system, as I told you. Excellent surgeon. He, he's one of our top eye surgeons. Anyway, a patient came in and wanted him to do a procedure that she wasn't warranted. And so he said, you know, I really can't recommend that we do that right now. The, the, the patient got really upset and got in his face and he said, you're an idiot. Well, the doctor got defensive because he didn't like somebody calling him an idiot um, and said, well, I've done a thousand of these procedures before and, you know, I know what I'm doing and got in this little fit, you know, fighting match over it. The guy stormed out of the office, got on Yelp right away, health grades and one other site and just blasted this doctor for being incompetent. And you can imagine how that doc felt after that. I mean, he's he, a top-notch surgeon. Now you got somebody, you know, writing all over the, the, the Internet about you. And so he said he couldn't sleep for a week. So he finally emailed me. He goes, can you come into the office and talk to me? I'm having a really hard time with this. So I go in, and, and we talk about it. And the right answer for him would have been what? Instead of going into this defensive mode, what should he have said? Some of you are going to be doing coaching for your staff as well. And so think of these answers because it's going to happen to you. Somebody said it. There you go. I'm sorry you feel that way, right? I can't, you know, we, clearly I can't meet your expectations. It's okay to use that word then. I'm okay. I can't meet your expectations. I do have a name. Maybe if, if you have another surgeon that you want to refer him to, but um, clearly I can't be that person for you. So done. End of story. There's no reason to get into that kind of battle. It, it's really difficult with some of these patients. Mine that I remember very distinctly when I was running the ER is a young mom who came in, a child had abdominal pain, and she insisted that she needed an ultrasound because she had re read somewhere on Facebook or someplace that ultrasound was the best way to diagnose abdominal pain in children. Yes, if you have an appendicitis maybe, but this kid was full of stool. I just, I know it. I even got an x-ray to show to her and there's balls of poop everywhere. And she kept saying, I really want an ultrasound. I need an ultrasound. Well, it was after hours and we weren't going to call in an ultrasound tech after hours for something that didn't need to be done, right? And she just would not let go of it. And she was, I want to talk to your supervisor. Well, I was a supervisor and there was nobody else for her to talk to at that moment. So I, we got to an impasse. So I said, okay, we're at an impasse here, right? I'm not going to get the ultrasound because it's not warranted, right? I've got the x-ray. Here's where we stand. What can I do to make this better, right? Because I got to give her an out. And she looked at me and she goes, I want a male doctor. Not much I can do about that. Uh, I had a male med student. That's all I had. So guess what? Do I offer her the male med student? Yes, because that's what she wanted. She wanted a male doctor. I said, I have a male med st medical student. Would you like to see him? And she said, yes. So I told him exactly what to say. Here's what you say. Here's what I want you to say. I know your child's uncomfortable. The x-ray shows a lot of stool in there. We're, we don't think we need the ultrasound just because we hate to make you wait any longer. They've already waited. We have to call the tech in, and we don't want to do procedures that aren't necessary. We're going to try this, this enema, and I bet you he's going to feel a lot better. End of story. Same thing that I just told her like 20 times already. He walks in, tells her what I told him to say, and she goes, oh, that makes so much sense. <laughs> She's happy with the visit, right? That really pissed me off, just so you know. <laughs> But, you know, sometimes you got to give them an out, and that was her out, right? Because she, she knew she kind of got to an impasse with me, but I gave her an out, and that's okay. Sometimes they're just not going to like you, and that's just the way it is, right? So I'm sorry you feel that was the right answer. Angry patients, again, are tough. you got to take yourself out of it. Like, don't go in the defensive mode. Um, I can see you're uncomfortable, especially the pain meds. The doctors think, you know, well, you know, our scores are going to go up if you, if you write the pain meds. Well, no, we have an opioid crisis right now. I'm not telling you to give meds, but you can do it in a nicer way. We have two docs in one of our emergency departments. One has a 90th percentile score. The other one 
less than fifth percentile. And I've, I've rounded with her, and I just I can't break through to her. She just treats everybody like they're a drug abuser, and it's really sad because not everybody is, right? And so you've got to be a little bit more compassionate about how you deliver the news. If you're not going to give the medication, that's okay. I see you're uncomfortable. You're on a care plan, so but here's what we can do for you today versus, you know what, you're not going to get any meds for me today. I mean, that's just a way to do it. Uh, your point is well taken. If they're upset about something, I promise to address your concerns. I get a lot of people who are, who are upset. They usually send me in to deal with them. And so I say, you know what, I understand your concern about whatever it is. I will promise you that I will take that forward. But right now, my immediate concern is how your health and your care right now. So I want you to trust me with this. I will take it forward. But my concern is you right now. That, that diffuses them as well, right? And then thank you for giving me a chance to address this matter. Uh, body language is important as well. I always stand with my back. I, I'm with the um, sheriff's department now. I teach their search and rescue class, so they're teaching me all kinds of cool things. But, you know, back against the wall, right? <laughs> so you can exit a little bit faster as well. You know, if, if for some reason you or your staff have offended the, the patient, I will allow, and I'm asking my staff this too. We have a culture change going on. I'd rather them tell me that I accept somebody than getting it on a survey or you know somebody else writing a Yelp reviews about me. So you got to be able to have an open relationship with your staff. I know that there are some doctors. I just again just did a session last week where the nurses said we can't we, we can't give her that feedback. She will not listen, and she doesn't even listen to us. You know, just about patient care, let alone giving her feedback. If you don't have that kind of open environment in your own department where your staff can come and tell you that this patient is really upset, you're not going to get anywhere. So you got to kind of do a culture change shift and be open to feedback. One of the ways is that we've put in is to say, Dr. Sharif, I've got some feedback for you. You're willing to listen? Or is now a good time? And I might be really busy right that moment. I say, not right now. I've got a sick patient coming in, but maybe we can talk in an hour, right? Or whenever I'm done with that one. And it gives them an opportunity to, to come and talk to me. And I, I've had so many saves. The nursing staff have saved my rear so many times because we have that open relationship and they know they can come and talk to me as well, right? All right. The anxious patient is a different one. They want to know what's wrong with them. Sometimes, you know, you, you see this all the time as well. They've had the, this pain for like five years, and now all of a sudden they decide to come to the emergency department, and they want you to tell them what it is and what are you going to do to fix it. And so most of the time I will start the conversation with, you know what, you've had this for a long time. I might not be able to give you that answer today, but what I can do for you is rule out some of the life-threatening things that I'm worried about, and that would make me feel better. I'm sure that would make you feel better as well. So let's make sure you don't have something that's, that's so serious that I need to keep you in the hospital overnight tonight, right? And so we get to that. I already tell them ahead of time that I'm not going to solve their problem most likely, and I go in with the good news, great news. You don't have, you know, aortic dissection, and you don't have whatever, 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 that should make you feel really happy, right? Now I'm going to refer you on to somebody else uh, who, who can uh, keep going with that diagnosis. That's, that's how you handle those patients. I always use the word informed. I'm going to keep you informed along the way. I actually tell patients, especially if they're agitated, how long they're going to be with me, right? You're going to be with me most of my shift, right? Because i got to try and figure out what's wrong with you as well. When I'm done in four hours, they think I'm a brilliant doctor, right? I got them in and out and very efficient. If they're there for six plus hours, it's okay. I already told them they're going to be there with me that long, right? And so think about that as well. All right. I think managing up is really important. We don't do well with that at all. Uh, I think we just sign out. I learned uh, one time I was, I was at P.F. Chang's, you know, learn from the environment. I was at P.F. Chang's, and actually it was just at a, a dumpling place this weekend with my girls, and they know the first story, and they did it perfectly as well. So P.F. Chang's, the server comes up. He goes, I'm going off duty, but Matt's going to bring you your lunch in your really good hands. This was many years ago. I go, God, that is so cool. And then we just witnessed it this weekend where the, the oncoming guy said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take good care of you, which I thought, that's just really cool. So they do this in the food service industry, and yet we take care of critical patients day in, day out, and many times you don't do a bedside sign over, right, which I think is, is really kind of shame on us. Think about how many times you've had to go in there and tell somebody you've never met before that they have a really critical diagnosis. I've told people they've had MI, they've had strokes, they have cancers, I've never met them before because we didn't take that time. Even the admitted patients, I talked to the ER group just last week, and they said, well, the patients are admitted, they're waiting for a bed, why do I need to go in there? And I said, well, think about this, how many times have you got called in to somebody who's been admitted because now they're deteriorating, and now you do have to go in there, and they don't know who you are. It's so it's all across the spectrum, right? Even if they're waiting for a discharge, it may take the nurses a while, at least the patient knows they haven't been neglected, right? So now we do sign over. I go in, I say, hi, this is Dr. Smith. I'm going off duty. I've told him all about you, and you're going to be in really good hands. I kind of set him up, right? Managed him up, and now when he comes in, gives news and have a relationship. I think, I really think you guys would think about that as well. It's rampant. We don't do that a lot. Even the nursing staff doesn't do it as well. And then 
We are better in the ER about not making disparaging comments about other staff members. We see stuff all the time, but boy, people definitely like to bash on the ER, don't they? Um, and that, that's really disappointing. That's kind of that culture building that we can do when we talk about the next talk this afternoon is how do you build your department. Part of it is making relationships with people outside the emergency department so they don't do that to us back. And then e e EHR, it's difficult or not difficult patients. The electronic health record has really interfered with the care that we provide where a lot of us are just typing on the computer. It's really impersonal. I would encourage you to, to explain what you're doing. I usually tell them, you know what, we've got this great electronic health record. The good news is everything you say is going to be in the computer now, so the next person taking care of you knows exactly what happened today. And you, the bad news is you've got a doctor typing, so bear with me for a second, right? And I show them the screen. I show them what I'm looking at. I never say, here's your vital signs. We use that all the time. They don't know what a vital sign is. Here's your heart rate. Here's your blood pressure, right? I show the screen to them, and then I make sure that I sit usually during the physical exam and absolutely during the discharge process. So I have some eye-to-eye -eye time with the patients as well. That's just so important, especially in the EHR uh, era as well. And then I, I tell them that, you know, I'm going to show you the, the lab results that we get, and I show them the computer. I learned, uh, again, learn from my mistakes. I learned the hard way about engaging the patient in the lab part of things. We had a patient, two 15-year-old boys that came in with abdominal pain, both right upper quadrant pain, same last name. And so when the resident was checking out with me, she showed me the labs, but it turned out it was a lab on a different kid. So we discharged that kid home, right? And then somehow, it's a very, it, life is odd. I woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning with severe epigastric pain, which I usually don't have. And I, so I said, I've got to get out of bed here. And I started, you know, reviewing the chart and signing off. And then the other patient's chart popped up, you know, the one that we sent home. His labs were sky high. He was, in re he was actually in liver failure. I mean, my God, we sent this kid home because, the res you know, the resident just kind of showed me the wrong screen. And I, I was able to call him back, got him directly admitted. But that, to me, was an eye-opener. And so what I do with every single patient now is I show them the screen. And I say, here's your name at the top, right? So they confirm whether or not it's them. And I show them the labs in real time. I, I think I'm sure I, that that has saved me some malpractice suits because it happens. We open the chart up and maybe get the wrong. I mean, what are the chances? You got two 15-year-old boys, both with the last name, and that was just everything had lined up incorrectly that day. And I didn't go back and make sure. So now I do it with the patients, and they feel good because they're seeing their labs. I show them the X-rays. You right? You can do that now on the computer. There's actually a, a lawsuit that I was an uh, expert witness on. They everybody. It was a ruptured appy that went bad, and the kid ended up doing okay after all, but long haul afterwards. But interestingly, the, the father said that he actually dropped the ER doc from the lawsuit, which was, which was fascinating to all of us. Like, God, that's where it started. And when they were, were able to ask questions afterwards, why, you know, why did you drop who you drop? And this is what the dad said. He goes, you know what? I looked at that CT scan with the ER doc. I didn't see anything. I don't know when dad went to radiology school. <laughs> Isn't that, it? Isn't that fascinating, human psyche? He felt like he'd missed something, so he didn't want him to blame the ER doc, which I thought was really, really, uh, you know, so an eye-opener for me. So now I do look at x-rays and, and things with, with the patients, right? And I say, if I miss anything, the radiologist will look at it again, and we may have to call you back, but I'm going to splint you just to be safe, or whatever I'm going to do with them. You have abdominal pain. I don't see anything right now, but I want you to come back in, you know, 8 to 12 uh, hours just to see you know, get a recheck in 8 to 12 hours. Some of us have such long waiting times, you just tell them to go back out and triage, right? And that eight hours will come back, and they'll be back, and you'll do your, your second exam. Um, that's how it goes. But um, anyway, so that's sort of a little bit about how I handle difficult uh, patients. told you a little bit about my, my personal failure as well. And we're going to talk more this afternoon about how to set up the emergency department and flow and things like that. So thank you for having me, and I will talk to you soon. <laughs>